So when the foreign key of a particular table is also part of its primary key, then we use the key migration notation as I have shown here. Okay, so if you are given just this entity relationship diagram and you are asked to find out what is the primary key for the section table, then you can clearly see that because of this hash sign here, clearly section name is at least part of the primary key. But because of the key migration notation here, we also know implicitly that course ID is also part of the primary key. And therefore, the primary key of this table is really the combination of course ID and section name. Okay, by just by looking at the diagram, we ought to be able to find that out. Let's consider this scenario here. So we've got courses in sections. That's fine. And this is just the ex except from the previous diagram. But we also know that in the sections table, we had an instructor ID as well, which also we did not show in the entity type. Right? We did not show the instructor ID here. Why was that? Again, that is because the instructor ID in the section table really represents the relationship that a section table, that the section entity type has to the instructor entity type. Okay, so you've got the instructor entity type and what this diagram says is every instructor may teach many courses or maybe not teach any course. That's what this dashed line indicates. But a section we are saying must always be taught by an instructor. So solid line here. And of course, because an instructor can teach many sections, you've got the crow foot also here. Okay, now we are not showing the instructor ID here as a foreign key, even though it's in the table, because this is a one-to-many relationship. And we know automatically that we will later on represent the relationship by adding the primary key of this entity type as an attribute in this entity type. Now, don't confuse between the key migration notation and just adding the foreign key or the primary key of another entity type as an attribute here. Don't confuse between the two. Because in this case, what we are doing is we are only saying the instructor ID is going to become an attribute in the sections table or a column in the sections table, section table. Okay, it's not going to be part of the primary key. It's just going to be a column. If it were going to be part of the primary key, then we would add the key migration notation here. The fact that the key migration notation is not here tells us that it's not part of the key, but it's still an attribute. Whereas here, course ID is an attribute and it's also part of the primary key because of the key migration notation. Okay, so this diagram is very important for us to understand the difference between just adding something as a foreign key and making it part of the primary key by using the key migration notation. It's a very, very important concept for you to understand. Okay, and that's what I have described in these two blurbs here. Pay very close attention to this particular slide to understand this concept. Okay, so let's do some practice problems just to prepare you for the assignments that are going to come up in this, in this part of the course. Okay, a person might own several cars or no cars. And let's say car ID is the primary key. And we say each car is owned by exactly one person with person ID is the primary key. Okay, now we are saying draw the entity relationship diagram and for each of the entity types that you identify, make up a couple of attributes other than the primary key that I've already indicated. Okay, so let's take this step by step. How do you approach something like this? Okay, this might be a conversation you may have when you're talking to a business person and trying to understand their business. Okay, so you've heard this in textual form. Of course, they're not going to say it exactly like this, but in conversation, you might gather this much information. How do you now start systematically translating that into an entity relationship diagram? I would say the first step for you is identify the entity types and their primary keys. Take it step by step. First thing you want to know, okay, what should be my entity types here? Okay, so here we can clearly see that the two entity types we are interested in are person and car, 
right? From this description, there's not much that much more that we can think of as as entity types. Okay, and I've just made up some some attributes. I said person has the primary key person ID that's already indicated. First name and last name I said are going to be required attributes and height. I just included something as an optional attribute. You might have come up with anything else. It doesn't matter. And car. Again, I said car is identified by car ID. Unfortunately, I seem to have missed making it a primary key. I'll do that in the handout. So this really should be uh, indicated as a primary key here. That primary key notation is missing. That's an error on my part. So car has a primary key and car ID is the primary key. And I just made up two attributes, make and model with make, making make as the as a required attribute and model as an optional attribute. Okay, so step one is identify the entity types and their primary keys. That's done, assuming that I fix this particular mistake. Next, again, continuing, it's the same problem, nothing different. I just repeated the description for convenience. Step two, identify the degree of the relationship. Is it a one-to-one, one-to-many, many-to-many, what is it? Okay, so we know from the description that each person can own several cards. And remember, when you're talking about the degree of the relationship, you're talking about the upper limit. So you're going to consider each entity type in turn. So person and car are the two entity types. One person can own at most how many cars? And then one car can be owned by at most how many persons? Those are the two questions we have to answer. And you're considering at most, you're considering in each case the upper limit. Okay, so each person can own several cars, upper limit, and each car can belong to exactly one person. That's what it says here. Each car is owned by exactly one person. So that's the upper limit. It can't be owned by more than one person. And therefore, we can see that this is a one-to-many relationship. So we fix the degree part of the relationship. That is step two. Step three, now identify the participation of each entity type in the relationship. In other words, person and car. Does a person always have to own at least a car? Does a car have to be owned by at least one person or what? You say, well, there could be people who own, don't own any cars. That means the person entity type doesn't have obligatory participation, right? That's what it says here. It says a person might own several cars or no cars. So clearly the description says, no, you can have people who don't own any cars. That is, in other words, the person entity type has non-obligatory participation. But for the car, it says each car is owned by exactly one person. There's no question of a car not being owned by any, any person. That means the car entity type in this description has to participate in the relationship and therefore it has obligatory participation. Okay, so putting both together, we can then make up the entity relationship diagram like this and of course I acknowledge that there's a mistake here the I should have the primary key sign next to car ID because that's the primary key so this is a mistake which I'll fix in the handouts that I'm going to give you other than that you see person has non obligatory participation dashed line car has obligatory participation solid line a person can own many cars crow foot a car can be owned by at most one person no crow foot so that turns out to be our complete entity relationship diagram. Let's consider one more problem. Construct an ER diagram for a car insurance company whose customers own one or more cars each. Each insurance policy covers one or more cars and has zero or more premium payments associated with it. Each payment is for a particular period of time and also has an associated due date in the date when the payment was received. It's a little bit more complicated than situations we have encountered. Again, let's apply our ideas here. First of all, identify the entity types and their primary keys. Okay, so we are saying we want an ER diagram for a car insurance company. Is car insurance company going to be an entity type? Not really, because this is the overall scenario for which we are building the ER diagram. There are not going to be many car insurance companies in our 
example, right, there are not going to be many instances of car insurance companies in our problem, and therefore that's really not going to be an entity type in this. Suppose you said there are going to be five car insurance companies. Each company has many employees. In that case, car insurance company is something that has many instances, and therefore you would make it an entity type. Here, that's not the case. Okay. So in many, in all situations, you will find that there is some noun that is used to describe the overall situation. You're talking about a company or a car insurance company or a university. You don't need an entity type for that. Okay, so car insurance company is not going to be an entity type. But we are saying there are many customers. Customer is going to be an entity type. There are many cars. And we are interested in information about customers and cars. So clearly customer is an entity type. Car is an entity type. And then we are also talking about each insurance policy covering one, one or more cars. So clearly there are going to be many insurance policies and therefore instances of insurance policy exist and therefore insurance policy is going to be an entity type as well. Cars, we've already said it's an entity type. And then we are talking about each uh, insurance policy has zero or more premium payments associated with it. So once again, there are many premium payments and therefore uh, and of course, we are interested in information about premium payments and the payments being made for which policy. So clearly, premium payment is going to be an entity type as well. And then we are saying each payment is for a particular period of time and has an associated due date and the date when the payment was received. Are there any entities in, in this last sentence? Okay, what about a particular period of time? Well, we are saying each payment is for a particular period of time. So this particular period of time, which may be you know, for the month of December 2013, that time period is actually an attribute of the premium. It's just like the first name of a customer. I could have also said uh, each customer has a first name and a last name. You won't think of first name and last name as attributes, in, uh, as entity types in this context. You would just say, well, those are just attributes of customers. Similarly, we'll say, the period of time and the due date and the date when the payment was received are all attributes of payment and not really entity types in themselves. So with all this information, we can create these four entity types. Customer with a person ID, first name, last name and height. I could have called it customer ID. Car with car ID, make and model. Policy. I've just made up some attributes, policy number, policy date, the annual premium for the policy, and whatever limits, the property damage limit and the medical limit that the policy provides. I just made up some attributes. Uh, in a real situation in the exam, for example, I would explicitly mention all the attributes or ask you to make up some of the attributes. So that's fine. Payment, again, all the information is there. Every payment is identified by a payment ID, payment date, payment amount, and a check number. I just made that up. I made some of them mandatory, some of them uh, optional attributes. Okay, so this is an important step. In fact, a very important step: identifying the entity types and making sure that everything that you are calling as an entity type follows all the rules of entity types that we discussed earlier. That it should be able to have instances, it should be a singular noun. And, and all that. It might have attributes, all of those things. Okay. Common problem is confusing attributes as entity types. So that's where you have to apply your judgment and say, is this an entity type by itself or is it just an attribute of some other entity type? Another way to look at it is, uh, if you say something is an entity type, then you need to be able to say it has attributes. Okay. So for example, consider period of time. What are its attributes? No real attributes. Due date. Can you think of any attribute for due date? Well, due date is a date. That's it. It doesn't have any attributes of its own. And uh, as described here, the due date itself doesn't have instances. right? So you have to apply your judgment and your common sense to identify what are entity types and what are not entity types. OK, so you've got that. And continuing the same problem, step two is identify the relationship degrees. There are several relationships that are pointed out here. Let's consider each one of them and try to figure out its degree. Okay, the first relationship is the relationship between customers and cars. 
okay it says customers own one or more cars each okay so clearly a customer can have many cars and implicitly we say every car belongs to only one customer okay that's implicit that's not explicitly stated but clearly you don't say that this car belongs to multiple customers okay you may say well people have joint ownership and so on in this example I'm just going to assume that so far as the company is concerned even if there are multiple owners one of those owners is taking out the insurance with the insurance company and therefore car belongs to one customer so that's a one-to-many relationship at least as we define it here how about the relationship between car and policy each insurance policy covers one or more cars okay so policy must have at least one car but it can cover many cars and implicitly we can assume that each car can be covered by just one policy okay and probably you can say it must be covered by one policy otherwise why is the insurance company dealing with it so once again it's a one to many relationship and again we are talking about relationship between policies and payments okay and it says clearly each payment is for a particular period of time okay each insurance policy has zero or more premium payments so it can have many payments associated with it but each payment obviously has to be against a particular policy once again that's a one-to-many relationship okay so we've got several three one-to-many relationships now you may say why is that we don't have a relationship between customers and policies Right? After all, an insurance policy is for a particular customer, right? I consider that to be an implicit thing, right? The policy is connected to a car and every car can belong to only one customer. So therefore, from that, you can figure out when you take a policy, who's the customer for that policy. Okay, that is why I have not explicitly shown the relationship between policy and customer because that can be inferred. It would be redundant to include it. Next step, identify the participation rules obligatory or not in this case every customer says has one or more cars so obligatory and each car we implicitly assume has to belong to a customer so both are obligatory car and policy again every car must be covered by a policy and a policy must cover at least one car so obligatory policy and payment we are clearly saying here every policy has a zero or more premium payment so it is possible that you have an insurance policy for which there is no payment how can that happen well we're not saying that there is never ever going to be a payment for this insurance policy all we're saying is at some point in time maybe the policy has just been sold and no payment has yet been made so it is possible that in your system you may see a policy which doesn't have any payments associated with it that's all we are saying Okay, so whenever we are talking about these participation rules, we are saying, can there ever be a time when you've got an entity type which is not related to the other entity type? If there can ever be such a time, then you'll say participation is non-obligatory. On the other hand, if you say there can never be a time that I've got this entity type and not connected to the other entity type, it can never happen, then you'll say it's obligatory policy obligatory participation right so we've got all this information based on this we can identify the ER diagram as shown here customer car it's a one-to-many relationship both have obligatory so you see that here customer car one-to-many relationship so you are a crowfoot both are obligatory solid line car policy again both obligatory fully solid line a policy may cover many cars a car can cover can be covered by only one policy so no crowfoot on this side payment and policy a policy may not have any payment therefore dashed line here solid line here because every payment must be against a particular policy and of course a policy could have many payments so you've got the crowfoot so that completes this example let's take one more example so here we are talking about the familiar university situation course can have many sections section is of only one course a student can be registered for several sections section could have many students or no students and a section must have exactly one instructor instructor may be teaching many sections or no sections 
and also we are talking about each student having an instructor as an advisor okay so this is a little more complicated than what we have looked at so far but again in if you are building a database for a university you might encounter all this kind of information so our job is to extract the information from this to enable a database design so as usual step one identify the entity types and their primary keys okay clearly we have seen these entity types earlier course section student and instructor those are the four entity types we see course section student instructor okay course we had course ID section we have a section ID and we already know that section is also going to have the course ID as its key so that's going to come up later we've seen this uh, part scenario earlier in the student and instructor and we've just made up some attributes not paying too much attention to attributes here so that's the entity types next thing we need to do of course identify the relationship degrees course and section is one to many because a course can have many sections it's possible and or zero sections that we'll see later but every section must be of only one course so that's one to many student section Clearly, the diagram says a student can be registered for several sections. A section can also have many students. Okay, so here we are encountering for the first time a many-to-many -many relationship. Right, you've got one student may be in many sections, one section may have many students. Right, that's the case in a university scenario. A student, of course, may be taking four or five courses. And if you take any particular section, you see many students are registered for it. That's a true many to many relationship and we'll have a lot to say about this in our in the next week but for now we'll just treat this as a many to many relationship okay so we'll have some we have to do something to a many to many relationship before we can deal with it but we'll come to that later and then section instructor it clearly says a, a section must have only one instructor but an instructor may be teaching many sections again that's a one to many relationship but in this case, we also see that there's one more relationship. That is the relationship between a student and instructor, which I have not shown here, but I'll show that in the diagram. The relationship between student and instructor is, uh, it, it was there in the previous slide. Let's take a look at that. Each student has an instructor as advisor, and each instructor must might be the advisor for many students or none okay now this description is unfortunately not showing up here but uh, if you look at that then you'll see that student instructor if I'm going to add that here is uh, a student has only one instructor as an advisor an advisor may be advising many students so that's going to be a one-to-many relationship as well now looking at participation Course is optional because a course may not have any sections. Section is obligatory. That's here. Student section, both optional. A student may not be taking any courses. That's what the description says. And a section may have no students in it. Again, from the description, and therefore both are optional. A section must have an instructor, but an instructor may not be teaching any section. That is optional. And then going to our relationship between student and instructor right it clearly says a student must have an instructor as a faculty advisor but a particular instructor may not be advising any students so that again is student has obligatory instructor has optional okay that's not shown here unfortunately I'll fix that in our handout so given all of this oh okay there it comes up instructor student is one too many and student is obligatory instructor is optional okay so given all of that our diagram now looks like this course section is one to many course is not obligatory section is obligatory and we already know that the primary key of section has course ID in it so we use the key migration notation section to student both are optional and it's a many-to-many -many relationship so you see the crow foot on both sides a section can have many students a student can be belong to multiple sections instructor and section once again it's a one-to-many relationship instructor can be teaching many sections section 
has only one instructor. Instructor need not be teaching any sections, dashed line. Section must have an instructor, solid line. And here, instructor and student. An instructor may not have any students to advise, but every student is advised by exactly one instructor. So no crowfoot, but an instructor may be advising many students. You've got the crowfoot. Okay, so that's how this description turns into an entity relationship diagram.